Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Katie Smaller. I'm the Director of Educational Programs here at the National History Academy. And today we are continuing on our journey through different sites in American history. And we are joined today by Park Ranger Kevin Patty from the George Washington Memorial Parkway. And uh, Ranger Patty today is going to be telling us more about Clara Barton National Historic Site. So Kevin, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about Clara Barton. Her story is very interesting, and this is a good time to focus on her. Her 200th birthday is coming up at the end of this month. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't even realize. That's awesome. Yeah. So I will share my presentation um, right now and get started. All right. Um, Okay, can you see that? Yep, looks good. All right, well, um, here's, here she is, Clara Barton, pictured during the time she lived in, in the house um, that I work at, Clara Barton National Historic Site in Glen Echo, Maryland, just outside of Washington, DC. It was the first national park site to be dedicated to a woman in 1975. And um, it's, it's, it was Clara Barton's home for the last 15 years of her life. And it was also the first permanent home to the organization that Ms. Barton had founded and would lead for, for 23 years, the American Red Cross. The building was a warehouse for their disaster relief supplies. It was a, a home for volunteers. Clara Barton was one of, of several volunteers who, who lived there. And it was their national headquarters between 1897 and 1904. Um, so they were ready to go under one roof. They had the people ready to respond to disaster and war. They had the supplies on hand and um, they even had the money. There's a vault in the corner of the floor where they had $3,000 ready to start an effort. So if the bank was closed, they didn't have to wait. They, they could go. The Galveston hurricane of 1900 um, that killed more than 5,000 people was responded to from Glen Echo by the American Red Cross. Uh, the Spanish-American War in Cuba was also responded uh, from this house in Glen Echo, now a National Historic Site. So um, Claire Barton's story is a, is a fascinating story and I wanna tell it to you uh, today. Um, and, and this house is a, a great place uh, to focus on her, on her life. Um, Claire Barton was the founder of the American Red Cross, but she was more than that. She was the heroine of the American Civil War. She's she provided aid to both sides of the conflict during the war at battle, many battlefields, including Antietam and Fredericksburg and Petersburg. She was also an advocate for African-American rights and for women's rights throughout her, her, um, her lifetime of, as, a, as a public figure. She was famous for 50 years and she brought that, um, that fame to bear on, on things she believed in such as equal rights. She was also um, uh, someone who, who worked to, to, to identify the missing and the dead after the Civil War. So there's lots to celebrate. There's lots to, um, to know about um, this public servant who, uh, who's really in our lives today. She, she invented the first aid kit. So if you have one in your car or in your house or at your workplace, um, you have her to thank for that. Um, so there's a lot to get into, and uh, let's first talk about her, her life, her childhood. She was from Massachusetts. Clara Barton was born on Christmas Day, 1821. So as I mentioned, well, her 200th birthday is coming up very, very soon. She was the youngest of five children. She had two brothers. She had two sisters. They were all more than 10 years older than she was. Um, so she felt like an only child because she was so separate in age from her siblings. But on the other hand, she had them uh, to benefit from as teachers. Her brothers gave her a great love for, for uh, outdoorsmanship and for uh, horseback riding. Um, her sisters gave her a love for, for literature uh, that she always maintained. So she, she felt that her older siblings were really teachers to her and they were teachers. Three out of four of those siblings were, were school teachers. And uh, that's what Clara Barton would become at 17. 
she overcame a very shy nature to start teaching school and she got good at it. It was really a tradition of service in her family. Her father had served in the local militia, was proud of it. Um, her grandfather had served in the Revolutionary War. The Barton family helped the poor in the community. So Claire Barton really had this, this uh, exposure, this ethic of, of, of service in her life. And there she is, a servant, a public servant at the age of 29. Here's the, the, the earliest photograph we have of Clara Barton. She had left her native home in Massachusetts. At 29, she wanted, after having taught in Massachusetts for many years, over 10 years, now she had taught. At, at this point, at 29, she's wanting to go to school herself. She's wanting to find a college that will welcome women in, 18, in the eight, early 1850s. And she found one. It was in New York. It was the Clinton Liberal Institute. And there it is. And it was a thrill to her to be there in this new place away from her home. She thought everything was bigger in New York. She thought the sky and the trees and the buildings were all bigger. It was an exciting thing to be there. And she took part in all the studies she could. She enjoyed the library and, and the people. She made a good friend at college. Her friend was Mary Norton. And after a year of study, at the invitation of Mary, Clara Barton moved to, Borden to, to, to New Jersey. She stayed with um, Mary in, and her family in Heightstown, New Jersey for a short time, and then moved her on her own, Clara Barton moved on her own to Bordentown, New Jersey. And on a Wednesday, she looked around and she could see a lot of kids roaming the streets. On a Thursday, on a Friday, on a school day, there were lots of school-age kids that were not in school in Bordentown, New Jersey. Why was that? New Jersey hadn't developed a public school system yet. Massachusetts had. Clara Barton had worked in many free in, in public schools in Massachusetts. But in New Jersey, these kids were roaming the streets because their families could not afford the subscriptions that it took for children to go to school. Clara Barton approached the officials of this town. She proposed this idea that she could start a school, that it would be free, and that she was willing to teach for free for a couple months if they let her give it a try. And they listened to her. They didn't know her from Adam. But they heard her out and they decided to give her a chance and they found this building that we're looking at. And on the first morning, imagine Clara Barton standing there at the door and there are six kids in front. Now she has to charm those six in inside. She has to sell them on this school by lunch because at lunch they have to leave and go eat. And then she has to hope that they're gonna come back and want to learn some more. And guess what? All six came back and they brought some friends with them. And on the next morning, there were 20 kids. And so if you're Clara Barton, what do you think you, you feel like? You know, that was great. She, she was off to a good start. And the town was recognizing this success. More and more families wanted to take advantage of this opportunity. The town's officials were recognizing that, that this was a viable idea, that they needed to invest in this. That for the next year, they would need a larger building. They would need additional teachers and a principal, someone to run this much larger institution. There would be 600 students involved with the second year of this school. Now, when they're looking for a principal, you think they look towards Claire Barton? She started the school. She led the school the first year. She did a fine job. They were grateful to her. They had no problem with the way she led the school. So when they're looking for a principal, do you think they look towards her? They didn't. They didn't. And why not? It was her gender. People um, in 1852, when they, um, when they thought of a principal or a doctor or a lawyer or a judge or a secretary of state or a vice president, they thought of a man. And so when they were looking for a principal to run a school of 600 students, they were looking for a man. And so they didn't consider, they didn't really consider Clara Barton as a candidate for principal. And so that unfairness, when they hired the, the man that they hired, they, uh, Clara Barton um, lost her will to work there and soon decided um, to leave that school, to leave New Jersey. But she had started the first public school 
in New Jersey. And that building is still there in Bordentown, honoring the history of that story. There's a rest stop on the Jersey Turnpike that also is honoring her for what she did. And where did she go next? She didn't go home to Massachusetts to pick up a life she'd already lived. She ends up coming to DC in 1854. She wanted to be in a warmer climate. She wanted to be near the uh, Library of Congress and take advantage of its collection. She had a sister in DC and uh, she went to her congressional representative in Washington, wanting his help finding a job. He also happened to be a distant relative of hers. And that gentleman, that representative, introduced her to, to the man that ran the United States Patent Office. The United States Patent Office was in that building, which is now housing the National Portrait Gallery, part of, um, part of the Smithsonian. And um, the idea of introducing Clara Barton to the man that ran the patent office, Charles Mason, was that Clara Barton might become a governess to Mr. Mason's family, work in his home, take care of his children. But it turned out that Mr. Mason was a forward thinking government leader. He was willing to hire Clara Barton to be a clerk at the patent office. And that makes Clara Barton one of the first women to work for the federal government. And she worked in that building and she, um, she overcame discrimination. Um, men that worked at the, the office spat tobacco juice at her and were not welcoming at all, they harassed her um, as she was a woman working, working in that environment. And she uh, persevered, she continued uh, to work in face of that harassment. And while she was doing that, Sometimes she would go to this building, our, in our nation's capital, and, and sit there in the audience and watch Congress debates laws. She was living in our nation's capital. She was a bright lady. She was civic minded. She was interested as the, in what was happening to our nation as this country was getting closer and closer to a civil war. And when um, that day came, on the attack on Fort Sumner in 1850, uh, 61, April 12th, 1861, started the Civil War. Um, Abraham Lincoln, president of the United States, in response called for volunteers from all over the North to come to DC and prepare for this war. They would train up in Washington. They would also protect Washington from the Confederacy. So Lincoln called for these troops to come to DC and some of the first to come happened to come from Massachusetts. They were the sixth Massachusetts. A lot of them are from Worcester County, the same area of Massachusetts that Clara Barton is from. And they traveled to Washington by train. And along the way, they have to change trains in a bunch of places, and one of which was Baltimore, Maryland. They had to climb off of one train. They had to walk through Baltimore streets to another set of tracks and another train. And as they walked, people pushed them. People yelled, people shot guns, people rioted, people threw rocks, because there were many people living in Baltimore that what didn't support Abraham Lincoln, didn't support the Union, but instead sympathized with the Confederacy. They were upset that Lincoln had called in these soldiers. And so the rioting that happened in Baltimore on the 19th of April, remember the Civil War starts on the 12th of April. This is the 19th. Um, that rioting spilled some of the first blood of the Civil War. And now those men, those boys really, had, um, would climb on that train and would complete their journey uh, to Washington, D.C. And arriving in Washington, um, hungry, many of them hurt, having lost their things, they, they needed some support. And the army wasn't organized, wasn't fully prepared to meet the needs of all these men. And Clara Barton was one of the people that volunteered to help, to meet them, to get things they wanted and needed. And as she worked to help these men, she started to find that she, they were definitely from where she was from. And, and in fact, some of them she knew as former students or as former, as, as former neighbors. And so uh, she wanted to help them and she did. And uh, which she'd go on to put ads in newspapers in the North where they were from and would ask people to send things to her. She could receive things 
to support the troops in DC. She can store them, those things, and use them to support the, the soldiers. And uh, the public wanted to help the troops. There wasn't a Christian commission yet or a sanitary commission. Those groups would do this kind of thing. They would support the troops later in the war. But here it is at the very beginning of the war. And Claire Barton is falling into this work and uh, getting a great response. She fills a warehouse. She fills three warehouses with supplies and then starts using these things around uh, the battle, uh, around the city. And then later on, as we'll learn, around the battlefield. And during that time, she meets this gentleman. Uh, his, his name, as we know him today, is Henry Wilson. His birth name was Jeremiah Colbeth. And his story is so fascinating, I can't resist the opportunity to tell it to you. He was from New Hampshire. He was about eight years older than Clara Barton was. And he was born Jeremiah Colbeth into a poor family. His um, parents were also um, not, not supportive of him. And they named him Jeremiah Colbeth um, as a way of trying to earn the favor of a local farmer whose name was Jeremiah Colbeth and that man was very wealthy. And so they hoped that that, that neighbor would pass away and leave, them, leave money to, to Jeremiah, to, to this man's family and because this man's family was very poor. That didn't happen, that didn't end up working out. And so Jeremiah's parents put him into an indentured servitude relationship where he at the age of 10 had to go work on a neighbor's farm, physical labor for 10 years, from the age of 10 to the age of 20. And the money from the indentured servitude of course went to his parents. Now, when the indentured servitude is over, Henry Wilson, Jeremiah Colbert still is now a free man and he goes, um, to Massachusetts and learns the trade of shoemaking and then goes into a business for himself and he, he raises up and does well. And at a certain point, he has 100 people working for him and he's successful, but he's worked so hard, he's worn himself down. He's, his health is, is poor because of such hard work. And he decides to go south to really vacation to Virginia to change the air, to go to a different place and get better. And on his way, he went through Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. As a tourist, he wanted to see D.C. And as he was walking, he looked up one day, he looked up and around the corner and all, guess what he saw? A slave auction was taking place before his eyes. African-Americans were being sold into bondage, separated from their families. And that moment politicized him. He went on to run for office in Massachusetts. He became the Senator of Massachusetts. And when the Civil War began, he went home to Massachusetts and raised a regiment of men and personally brought them in, into DC. Uh, he, he changed his name. He didn't want to be Jeremiah Colbeth. He became Henry Wilson. And uh, he was on the Military Affairs Committee and was very important during the Civil War. Um, he, he's the guy that ended slavery in D.C. He is a politician that worked hard to do that. He got African-Americans the right to serve in the military and got them the same pay as white soldiers. Um, and so Clara Barton met, met Henry Wilson um, during this time, and he became a great advocate to her, a great ally to her. When she ran into red tape, when she ran into bureaucracy or, or uh, prejudice, um, she could call on him and he could help her get through those moments. And so Clara Barton would gather all these supplies, as I've mentioned, and then she would decide that they were most needed, not in DC, they were needed out on the front. And to get it there, she had to take, it, take those things. And so she had to gain permission from a reluctant military to let a woman go to the field. She had to talk her way into that to that permission. And then um, she would get wagons, military wagons driven by um, Teamsters or military would provide the driver and she would take her things out into the field. And she went to Fredericksburg and Petersburg and Spotsylvania and South Mountain and Antietam. Uh, she was there at Antietam on September 17th, uh, the day of the battle and she survived. 
And so she's not just a supplier, she's a battlefield nurse, or you might say a battlefield medic, because she's on the field during the battle at Antietam. A bullet goes through her sleeve and kills the man that she's helping at Antietam. She was at the attack on Fort Wagner in South Carolina. If you've seen the movie Glory, if you haven't seen it, you should see it with Denzel Washington and Matthew Broderick. When the African American soldiers storm the fort, Claire Barton is there and she speaks eloquently of the bravery that she saw in the African-American troops. And so by the end of the Civil War, here she is in her mid forties, she's a real heroine. She's someone that people know and people like. She's a celebrity. She's a woman that went to the field as a volunteer and um, helped soldiers. And so um, after the war, she would, uh, devote her time to trying to identify the missing and the dead. People sent me messages. They wrote her letters. Throughout the war, they wrote, Claire Barton, you were at Antietam. Our son John was at Antietam. We don't know if he's alive or not. The army hasn't kept good records. They, they don't know if he's alive. Have you seen John? You were there. Have you seen him? Have you heard anything from him? This happened so many times. She received so many letters that she decided that she could do something about it. She, throughout the war, she kept names. She kept lists of who, who she saw die and who, who they were. And so she continued to do that. She made lists of missing men. And then she decided to, to um, open this office. Abraham Lincoln supported the idea. She got the permission of the government printing office. Um, they would print the lists and she'd put lists in post offices all over the North. And then she'd ask veterans, people that had served in the war, to look at the list. If they knew anything about any of those names, they should tell her. And then she could tell the family of the of the love of their, you know, of the soldier. And that system produced results. It worked. And she went to Annapolis where ships of soldiers came back after having served, and they would look at the list and tell her what they knew. Now, a gentleman named Dorrance Atwater, who had been um, imprisoned in the Confederate prison in Andersonville, Georgia, came to Clara Barton at her office and said, I was in this prison in Andersonville and I worked in the government, I worked in the prison office. My job was to keep a record of all the people that had died at Andersonville. I kept a secret copy and here it is, Clara Barton, and let's work together to identify the, the, the resting place of these people and to communicate with their families. Now, Clara Barton, uh, so he had a huge list of names of, of union men that had died there. Clara Barton went to Andersonville and she worked to, to create the, the, um, the National Cemetery that's there. And, the, and she did exactly what, what Doran Satwater uh, wanted to do. And while there, she saw how inhumane the conditions were for prisoners at Andersonville. Um, just outside the prison gates, there was a, a lovely stream, very clean, good water, but inside the prison, these, these union men that were imprisoned were made to go without water, very poor water. Um, they were made to live without shelter and, and it was truly inhumane. And so Clara Barton kept that in her mind, she was struck by that um, scene. And that would pay, play a big part in what's to come in her wanting to form an American Red Cross. Now, this lady has a very interesting story. She was a friend to Clara Barton. They met when Miss Barton was down there um, in Hilton Head, right before the attack on Fort Sumner, or the attack on Fort Wagner, you know, the movie Glory. Francis Gage was there. And Miss Barton became friends with her. Frances Gage had grown up in Ohio uh, near the Kentucky border. And she had left, she had helped um, African-Americans escape slavery and, and gain freedom. And so she became an activist. She gave lectures about what she believed in. She, be, she gave lectures about women's rights and African-American rights. Um, she also was a, a, a writer. She had a 
a pen name, Avant Fanny, and so she was an editorial writer um, who wrote, she was an activist. And she made Clara Barton understand that she too could be an activist, that she could use this, this celebrity that she had gained to help um, form opinions and help, help uh, uh, move people. And so that, that was a strong influence in Clara Barton's life. And so she also, Mrs. Gage encouraged Clara Barton to lecture. And so she does that. And here's a poster that advertises it. This brings her greater um, financial income uh, that she was really needing at this point. And it also made her more famous and, and politicized her. She talked about her Civil War experiences. She could also lend her voice to these subjects that we've talked about. Henri de Nantes uh, is the gentleman that formed the Red Cross. The Red Cross was in Europe. Uh, it started in Switzerland. The Red Cross flag is the reverse of the Swiss flag in honor of Switzerland, where Henri de Nantes started the Red Cross. Henri de Nantes was traveling through Italy in 1859 when he came upon the aftermath of the Battle of Solferino. He saw this brutal scene this terrible battle and nobody was there to help in the aftermath. And he thought up the idea that there could be an organization of volunteers who would be neutral, who would help everybody involved with the war. And, uh, and so he would form some meetings and would create the Geneva, the meetings would, would produce the Geneva Convention. Um, France would sign the Treaty of Geneva, come back and form a French Red Cross. The Germans would form a German Red Cross. And when there was a war, they'd put a red cross on their arm and they would go out and, and help everyone involved. And so Clara Barton um, had worn, her out, worn herself out during the Civil War um, and, and in its aftermath. She had worn herself out traveling the lecture circuit. And so at the advice of her doctor, who felt that she was verging on a nervous breakdown, Clara Barton went to Europe to rest, to recover, to, to vacation. And in Europe and in Switzerland, she learns about Henri de Nantes. She learns about the Red Cross movement and um, becomes impressed with, with what it's all about. Now, remember, she had seen the inhumanity of Andersonville. She had seen um, how terrible one side was to another side. And so the idea of the Red Cross being neutral being helpful to everyone, being fair to enemy combatants. Um, those principles really um, inspired Claire Barton. They showed her that this is what we need. We need to be a part of the Red Cross. And so this is her door in Glen Echo, in the, in the house that I work at. And so um, she had to come back and sell the idea to us. She, she volunteered for the German Red Cross in Europe during the Franco-Prussian War. She was impressed with it. And now she comes back to America saying there should be an American Red Cross. And America said what? They said, why? We had a Christian commission. We had a sanitary commission. The war's over. Those things worked fine for us. Why do we have to sign a treaty? We don't like signing international treaties. We want to make a, no entangling alliances. Um, why do we do, want to do that? And Clara Barton's response would be, the American Red Cross will be different than the Red Cross in Europe. It won't be just about war. The American Red Cross will help during a hurricane and a flood, when, during a tornado, during an epidemic of disease. And that was much more appealing to American leaders and to the American public. And so um, she worked for years to, to sell the idea. And finally, she did. And the United States signed the Treaty of Geneva when it did because of her work, her lobbying. Here's the house that we've talked about, Clara Barton National Historic Site, with there, Clara Barton standing right in, in, in front. Um, she liked living in Glen Echo. She loved living there, in fact. Now I want to talk about one of the efforts that was responded to. Uh, this one just before she started living in that house. The Johnstown flood, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Johnstown was a big town below a lake and the lake was held by a dam. 
that the dam was poorly maintained. And after years of neglect, after days of rain, after warnings about the dam, it failed and devastated Johnstown. Um, this was a big story, a big drama. People all over the country read about this and um, they wanted to help. Um, and uh, these are middle-class people that were, were uh, affected and, and there, were, there was a great deal of um, relief for them. The American Red Cross responded quickly, but other organizations and churches and the government responded quickly. And Clara Barton was able to do good work there. They formed, they built buildings that would serve as shelters. Uh, the house in Glen Echo is patterned after those buildings. Um, they, they, they put people that lost their homes, stayed in rooms in these buildings. And then in the center, there was a dining hall where they could all have their meals together. Now, in contrast to that, the Johnstown flood uh, affected white people. And um, the, the media wrote about that um, disaster uh, openly and liberally. Uh, and people responded to it uh, because they could uh, they could empathize with the people of Johnstown. Another disaster that happened a couple of years earlier, also responded to by the American Red Cross, was the Sea Islands Hurricane of 1893, and that affected African Americans um, uh, in South Carolina um, when when a, a tidal wave came and devastated them. And um, the government didn't respond in the same way at all. The, the media didn't respond. Um, and, uh, and then as a result, the public didn't respond in the same way at all. And that's all because of, of the racism that existed. And so Clara Barton would respond, but her response was um, affected by all of those, those other things. Here she is arriving in Sea Islands. They, they produced, um, uh, here, here they are with potatoes that they would plant so that the African-American residents of Sea Islands, many of them former slaves, formerly enslaved people, would be able to um, develop a way to feed themselves in the future. Uh, also from Sea Islands, Clara Barton's office in Sea Islands. And here she is back in Glen Echo, Maryland, in front of of her house, um, also of her house where she employed African-Americans, uh, some of them formerly enslaved African-Americans who worked uh, at her house. Clara Barton was um, at the end of her life when she lived in this building, an advocate for, for women's rights and African-Americans rights. She knew both Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass personally and uh, worked with them to bring greater rights to women and, and African Americans. Um, here she is at the uh, at her desk in in her Glen Echo home in 1902. And she's 75 when she comes to live in Glen Echo, and she's still leading the American Red Cross, still responding to disaster in person. The Library of Congress has 23 medals that were awarded to her in gratitude for her work, and here she has some of them on her. The amethyst pansy in the center was a gift from the Grand Duchess of Baden in Germany for Miss Barton's work during the Franco-Prussian War. We have her desk as it appears to visitors when the house is open um, and, and one of many closets. There are more than 50 closets in this house that held things like this, handle lanterns and, and pots and pans and tents and food and, um, and bandages. Clara Barton's bedroom is bandaged. The ceilings and walls are covered with bandage material, a material she had a lot of. The house was a gift. It was built for her as a gift. The developers of the town wanted her to live there because she was so famous and well-known, well-liked. Um, but she had to finish the house and she was frugal and resourceful. And so she used this material she had, bandages, to cover the, the ceilings and walls. Here we see um, second floor hallway with uh, a guest room. It's a great big house, the front parlor, the rear parlor, uh, where she could receive callers and guests. And a great picture. 
down of, of the whole house. A place that really honors her legacy of being um, a volunteer, a, a, an engaged citizen. Even a time when women were not um, looked upon to, to uh, get involved with, with things that she got involved with. Uh, she took it upon herself to do that. So she's an inspire, she's an inspiration uh, to all of us as a, as a volunteer and as a citizen. And uh, of course she created things that we, uh, that we benefit from today. Um, she, the Geneva Convention that she uh, helped to get us involved with um, the American Red Cross, the first aid kit, um, public education. And so uh, I hope this gives you a sense of her story. And uh, if you have any questions, I would love to answer your questions. It really does. Thank you so much for sharing all that, Kevin. This is really fascinating to hear. Uh, we are gonna bring in uh, Ben Kellerhals. He's our intern, former NHA student, and he is currently a junior at the University of Arizona. And Ben's gonna um, take some questions for you. Yeah, so um, let's jump in. We got some good good food for thought. Um, one, of, one question we have is, uh, do we know any of the inspirations Claire Barton may have had? Uh, what female activists she may have looked up to and maybe how other female activists later looked up to her? Well, I mentioned Frances Dana Gage, who really was a good friend of hers and a correspondent. They wrote letters uh, to one another. She really was the inspiration uh, for Ms. Barton to um, become political and, and lecture and, and talk about what she believed in. Um, her father also comes to mind. Her father was um, a great inspiration. He was a soldier. Um, he was proud of that service and talked about it. And um, she was, she really looked up to her father. So he was an inspiration. Um, she was close with her siblings as well. Um, um, that would be my answer, my answer to that. It's a good question. Nice. Yeah. Um, and we know you mentioned um, right before as we were getting started that her 200th birthday is coming up. So what does the site have planned for that event? Well, thank you for asking. We've, um, we've already started. There's a performance. We have an actress, Marianne Jung, who's going to perform as Clara Barton. Uh, on our Facebook page this Saturday at 10 o'clock, but it will be available throughout the weekend. So you can watch it anytime Saturday after 10 o'clock. You can watch it Sunday and then it goes away. So you got to see it either Saturday or Sunday. And she is an actress who does a one woman show. She's done it right there in that hallway for years and years, but this is the first time that we're, we're having her do it virtually. And she's, um, she's a great actress. She does a great job of portraying Clara Barton and telling a story of her life. And that takes about 45 minutes, that show. Um, and then we have um, a, a, a group of video messages that are coming up. We've asked um, parks nearby, uh, parks that are related to Clara Barton, like the Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site in Richmond, Virginia. They're gonna do a video message that we're gonna show on our Facebook and on our website. Um, Manassas Battlefield is doing one. Claire Barton National Historic Site has done one and is working on a second. And uh, the Bordentown Schoolhouse is doing one and, and someone else I'm forgetting. So um, we're gonna be showing these, these messages in the days leading up to um, the birthday, the 200th birthday. Awesome. That sounds like a lot of good stuff. I'm sure everyone will like to check that out. Um, so. In the interest of time, we'll get to something we always we always want to make sure to ask um, you. How did you get to where you are at working at this historical site? Maybe if you have any advice, we have a lot of young audience members who might want to be exactly in the kind of place that you're at now. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. Um, I was a Boy Scout. I, I was into scouting and um, That was really a formative experience for me. Uh, my dad was a scout leader and, and towards the end of my scouting time, an assistant scoutmaster suggested that we go down to the Department of the Interior and look 
look for maps of this property that we'd been camping at. And he, we walked the halls and there was an application for a seasonal job and he handed it to me and said, here, fill this out. So he put the application in my hand and I filled it out and sent it in. And months later, I got a response and an interest in having me serve as a, a seasonal park ranger. Park rangers work generally seasonally. They work in the summer only for a few years before they finally get a, a full-time real job with the park service. And that's what happened with me. So I was fortunate. I, um, I've always had an interest in history as well. So um, it's really worked, worked well. I've enjoyed it. Um, um, so my advice is, you know, the Park Service um, has employment opportunities, but there are other organizations if, for people that are interested in this kind of work, um, the state parks, the county parks, um, and then lots of nonprofits that do history work. Um, and it's all important work to get people to know um, the history. That's great. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing that and really looking forward to checking out those programs. So thank you for being with us today and we really appreciate your time. Sure, you bet. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. And thank you everyone for joining in. Um, you can join us back here next week, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Standard Time, uh, Eastern Standard Time, as we visit with the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park. So hope to see you there and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.